for Northern. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, it's a very magical place. Um, Northern California is very lucky. And uh, we all tend to have a very soft spot for this uh, Jake Jackson museum. Uh, a lot of fantastic people there. So um, that's pretty awesome that you did this, John. So. All righty. So this is the um, Jake Jackson Museum Blacksmith Shop. If we can go to the next slide. And there, that's the inside of my shop. I named it not too long ago, Moon Shadow Forge. So I like that. And here's the outside. And I think we're going to fly into the inside here. All these parts and pieces on these two tables are all part of this project, this workshop. Most of the equipment in there is um, homemade. The uh, hydraulic press there on the left now, Sean Wilson owns that. Um, so there we are. And there's sample pieces and practice pieces. Um, and I do have all the pieces necessary to assemble this completely done and ready to go. And during this video, I'm going to go through making one of each of the elements. OK. So we're going to do this in two sessions, like Victoria mentioned. I'm going to talk about the design and constraints in design. And tonight we'll go over the square corners, mortise tenons, the twist, and at least the ribbon scroll. And then we'll see where we are. So the, the project is, or the client is, um, the Weaverville Workshop to de design a sign bracket. And it's good. And I was told it's going to be fitted between two um, square tubing posts that are going to get installed later. And the existing wooden sign is 12 inches tall, 40 inches wide, and three quarters of an inch thick. And I want to gear all of the work toward level two skilled people or thereabouts, okay? And here's a picture of, in a circle is the installed sign. Um, it's hard to get anything out of that picture, but if you're not fami familiar with the Weaverville grounds, um, this is looking down from the sidewalk on Main Street and this area is all full of forges and people at working at their forge. Here's a picture of the finish sign, a close-up of it. Um, you can see it's got the scrolls from the level two grill in it. They're shaped a little different. Um, it's got upset corners on the ends of the horizontal bars. There's upset corners where the vertical bars intersect with the sign. There's tenons on the end of those, and there's collars and punched holes. So most of my experience is doing architectural work. And that is a guardrail that has to fit in between two posts that are on the front porch maybe, or a stair railing that's going up the side, up a stairway. And so what I call the hard facts are the things that I can't, that I have to work to. If I'm gonna build a railing that fits in between two wooden posts, it has to fit between those two wooden posts. And no matter what I wanna, no matter what I 
wish it would look like it it has to conform to certain um, constraints and with this project it's pretty wide open the sign's 12 inches tall and 40 inches wide and since they're going to put the posts on later the width of the um, horizontal bars is not critical and the height is it doesn't have to fit into anything um which is is nice okay so we can go to the next one i think so this is the golden mean and i use this a lot in uh, coming up with designs because if if you from the last picture you saw there's just this wooden sign there it's like okay what are you going to do to this to make it interesting and usually when i sit down at a blank piece of paper um i will roughly sketch to scale those hard facts if there's posts and you know what the top of the railing is going to be etc and i'll use this golden mean um, as a way to help block out designs or shapes or voids or forms and you can see by this picture it's it's squares and rectangles um, and it goes back to the rule of threes which is used in art all the time this golden mean um, was described by Greek philosophers and mathematicians, and and uh, it's found in nature everywhere. It's found in proportions in the human body, um, but it it's basically developed by a square, and there's a relationship to make that square into a rectangle. So if we can go to the next, and here's the the square would be one, and the long side of the rectangle would be 1.62 and that's um so i use that a lot in just blocking out my where i want things to go and how they should be in proportion to each other and i'll use i'll use the long side dimension and multiply it by 0.62 or the short side dimension and multiply it by 1.62. So I wanted, I know I'm going to use scrolls in this somewhere. I haven't designed the, the finished product yet, but I'm going to use scrolls in there, probably on the top and the bottom. Recording in progress. Pardon me? That was Zoom telling someone that there's a recording in progress. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, you're doing great. Okay, so. I didn't want to crowd the sign too much. I wanted it to have some prominence in whatever we're going to do here. So I'm going to, I figured I'd have some negative space around the sign. So what's the right amount of negative space to have? So I took the height of the sign, which is 12 inches, multiplied that by 1.62, and that comes to 19 and a half. So I figured I put the horizontal bars at 19 and a half and here we are we have three and three quarter inches on above and below so now how wide should the sign be well let's just use the same reveal of three and three quarters all the way around it so now i've got a start on a design and so if we do all that math Anyway, I don't want to get it too tied up in the math, but um, you want me to go back one. So now the wood sign, the wood sign is 40 inches wide and you multiply that by the 0.62 comes to 23 and three quarters. So that might be a good place to put the vertical bars. And as it turned out, it's serendipitously, it's right where the letters start and stop. That was not, that was a happy accident. 
Maybe they had used that <laughs> to make the sign. <laughs> Maybe. So now that I've got the overall width, we got that at 47 and three quarters, I think earlier. With the 24 and three quarters, that leaves seven and five eighths hanging out on the end of the sign. And so trying to keep things the same sizes and shapes, where can I use the seven and five eighths again? Well, we'll make the top of whatever scroll work is up there at seven and five eighths. And so now things to me are looking proportionally pleasing. And so with the 47 and a half, we're going to go times 0.62 and we end up with 29 and a half. So let's use that as the place to attach the scrolls. And this gets only nerdier from here on, but we're almost there. I love the math. <laughs> well, it, yeah, I'm numbers get me all discombobulated, but it helps. This helps me get to where I want to be. So the outer collars, that 29 and a half, what happens if we multiply that by 0.62? We get 18 and a quarter. So let's use that as the width of whatever is going to happen at the bottom of the sign. And then let's keep the same reveal of three and three quarters. And so that has the whole parameters of the of the sign laid out because I haven't drawn any scrolls yet, but I've worked out the the form and the shape of the frame. And here's the close up of um, the finished piece. It is a little different from the original drawing that I made, but we will see that later. But it does include all the collars and upset corners and um, all, the, all the things we wanted to include are included in it. So do you ever, do you ever do this by just seat of the pants as in drawing it and looking at it and say, this looks right. I mean, the whole math thing is like, oh my gosh. Um, well, you know, you kind of, you kind of draw it out and say, this looks good. This doesn't, let's play with the proportions. Well, yes. When I, when I first started in this and started drawing designs for different ironwork, um, you know, I was getting pretty cocky with myself and, oh yeah, this is, uh, I can draw all this and this is really cool and this looks great. And then I went to, um, it was a blacksmithing event. I don't know if it was Mark Asprey or one of the English Smiths came over and was talking about this golden mean and I'd never heard of it. And I thought, hey, I can draw designs. I don't need somebody to tell me what math makes the design look good or not good. And, you know, I kind of just, oh, this is just a bunch of hooey. This doesn't mean anything. And then I went back and started looking at some of the drawings that I'd made without um, using that. And I was actually right in the ballpark. And so I thought, well, man, it took me a whole, it took me a whole lot of thinking and erasing and drawing and erasing to come up with these designs. Now, if I can get a layout that's, I can get myself in the ballpark before, I can save myself a lot of work by, by experimenting. It's like, okay, this is gonna go in here and this is gonna go there. And, it, and it's not hard and fast rules, you know, because you'll see there's a couple of things I changed later um, and disregarded the math. But it, it, for me, it just helps me get to, okay, this is the space that I'm going to put this kind of a design into rather than draw the design. And, oh, no, that's now it's too big. Oh, now it's too small. Now I got to draw it again. And oh, maybe a little bit bigger would be better. So this just kind of gives me a, 
a guideline to go by. So John, Mike Mumford's asking, uh, why decide to put scroll detail at the bottom versus nothing? Well, I wanted to have, this was gonna be a work, for one thing, it's gonna be a workshop. And if, you know, if a whole bunch of people wanna get involved, there's only, you know, eight scrolls at the top, it gives, you know, another part for somebody to be able to make. And I don't know, I just thought something ought to happen at the bottom. Does that help, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> so preparing- He's a nice for... balance. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, there I see it, okay. So this says more hard facts. Um, this is more for the preparation preparation for going up to Weaverville. Um, not knowing how many people are gonna wanna get involved, not knowing what their skill levels actually are and wanting to have the project completed while I was there. Um, Get a features, jigs and scrolls and sample pieces and uh, storyboards. So that's where we're going to go with this. Yeah, and you you didn't want to start over, right? Like you had some of these things already. Was what right? You, well, you had existing scroll jigs. Yeah, I didn't make I didn't make any for this particular project. Um, they're all, they're jigs that I have for making the, this style of scrolls and then they can be kind of adapted with other jigs. I have a whole wall full of jigs. Um, <laughs> and these five, I believe are the only ones that were used, um, on this project. There may have been one more, um, but you can see one of them is marked half penny. The one right to the left of that, I think, is the snub in. Um, and these are scrolls that I've made over the years. Some of them are the one on the on the far right is probably 40 years old. No. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's it's probably 30 years old. I think I made that in Oakland with the man who taught me how to do this. Um, and so I use them, and that one gets used all the time. I use a lot of these over and over again. I don't, I try to design the scroll work to the scrolls that I already have, the jigs that I already have. Um, there's been um, some work that John McClellan has subcontracted to me and it's like, oh, I got to make these jigs, you know, these scrolls are different than the ones I make. So now I got to make a jig to, to make these 40 scrolls. And, you know, doing a one-off like this project is where there's only two of each scroll is not that big a deal to get through it by hand. But when you have you know, like I say, most of my experience has been with architectural projects and I do maybe do 50 or 100 of one scroll. And I'm not gonna do that by hand, one off. So it's, it's jigs for everything. And then these are um, storyboards. I made these back in 2016 for a workshop that um, I did at Salt Lake City for Abana. Um, and, and these are the, there's the half penny, the ribbon scroll and the snub in scroll. I have, um, since then made one for the bevel scroll, but this way, someone that's maybe hasn't made too many scrolls can have a step-by-step, -step, um, storyboard to look at and, and you build these scrolls. 
And these are cool. They're, you can take them all out of this little box. Yeah, they all come out. They're three eighths by 12 inches of three eighths by one flat bar. And yeah. It, it's always interesting to me how long it is when it's straight, but you just put a short little scroll on the end and it cuts the length but way down. <laughs> yeah, you can see that there. So these would go along with it. Um, so getting getting back to the um, design work, I've got the frame blocked out where I want it. And I know what scrolls I want to use. And well, how do I want to use them? How do I want to decorate that top and that bottom? And I have a library of ornamental iron books and um, books like, well, like the one Carol had in the beginning here, where I will thumb through uh, just to get a, a new idea or a different idea or something to, something to get me kind of turned on. And this book that's featured here, um, Thomas Wilson's Iron, or, Ironwork Notebook, um, Mark Cochin gave that to me right before I did this. And there's, there's a picture of that. And this whole book is what you see in the background. These are door pulls and there might be half a dozen pages of these and everyone's a little different. And you can see progressions from one design to another one. And it's not like Otto Schmirler designs does work in his way. And I have a couple of his books, but it's his own design where this Thomas Wilson book, he just goes off like crazy. And there's all kinds of, of really interesting um, designs in there and sketches. And so I sat down, looked through this book to get an idea of, you know, something a little different, something you know, that I might not normally think about. And I did pick up a couple of um, ideas out of there to incorporate into the design. And when we get to that, I'll talk to, but this is, this is an outstanding book for, hmm, what do I, what do I want to make? How do I want this to look? And just thumb through here. If this doesn't get your juices flowing, I don't know. And I like how his, some of his sketches even have um, shadows in there. Right? Yeah, they're just really yeah, detailed yeah. drawings. Yeah, they're great, great drawings. And it's like, oh, wow, look at that. Yeah, I should try that on, you know, where I'm going to attach that part coming in or whatever. And I always like to put in something that I haven't done before or that I don't know how I'm going to do it. So, um, so then I worked up the sketch for the scroll work on the top and the bottom. And again, I always try to sketch to scale. And then um, once I get my sketch and drawing done, then I go to a full size drawing. And then I'll take the full size drawing transfer it onto a sheet of particle board. Um, I like the particle board because it's it's also called underlayment. It comes in, I think, three eighths, half, five eighths, and three quarter. Um, it's got a smooth surface. So your pencil will go wherever you want it to go. It won't get caught in uh, the wood grain. Uh, and then it can be erased or sanded and used over and over again. And what's nice about it is like with this frame, it's 48, 47 and three quarters inches wide. I could draw it on a, a four by eight sheet on one end, cut the other end off. And then I have a, a table to work on that's just the right size as the piece that I'm working. If I did a and then if I um, have a like a deck railing that's I've drawn on the four by eight foot sheet, and now 
I've got maybe a garden gate that's three foot by six foot. I can just cut, cut that four by eight sheet down to three by six. And, I, and then now it's a fireplace green that's four by three. I cut it down again for that. And if you have to get a clamp out in the middle of something, just cut a hole in it and just whittle it down as it, because if you do it on a steel table, you're pretty um, limited by being able to get to certain places. And, you know, it's re reusable over and over again, as long as you don't burn it too bad, it does, it does burn. But then once I've got the full size drawn, drawn on the, on the uh, particle board, then I know exactly what I'm needs to be made to, to the exact shape. And you don't have, there's no guesswork later and no, oh, that came out too long. I wish I had realized that. So anyway, there's the book. Now here's the um, original drawing. And you'll notice if you remember from the last one, the picture there's some, there's some changes in here uh, there we go we have both both images there the um the twist in the big scrolls on the top that came out of um thomas wilson's book i, I saw some that he had done like that so i thought oh that's kind of a cool element and it worked out nice the um, smaller upper scrolls that are the ribbon scroll on the end where the pointer is and the um, half penny scroll on the inside, they're touching the top bar, but they're not collared to it. And they're not touching the bevel scroll. And I got looking at it and thinking, this is out in a public place that anybody can get to it at any time. Um, I'm a little worried that those bottom scrolls, if there's only one point of real contact because we're not welding anything together. The only thing that's holding this scroll work on is, is the collars. And I thought those could get spun or pushed in and out. So I went back to my typical way of doing it, of bringing the scrolls together with a collar on them and collaring them down to the um, horizontal bar. And then I thought, well, just to make it a little more dainty looking, raise up the ribbon scroll on the outside and leave a, leave a space in there. So I made those changes before it went to the particle board. And then the bottom scroll design just I don't know why it just looked too, too big, too long. And so I shortened it up and uh, made the tips drop down a little more and give it a little bit of a curve in there. And that's, you know, the, doing all the math and all that, it, that's just a guideline. You know, it, it has to look good to you if you're going to make it and put your name on it. So with that um, design, we're going to go to the particle board. Here's a picture of the particle board with everything's drawn on it um, in pencil because the pencil erases the main part of the frame, the horizontals and verticals and um, sign were just drawn on there with a framing square and straight edges and a ruler. There was no real need to transfer that part of the of the um, drawing on there because I, I could do it actually faster just drawing that on there. But getting the scrolls drawn in um, is a little trickier. So what I do with that is go to the original full size drawing, take a piece of tracing paper, lay it over the top of that, trace the scroll on there. And actually, this is how I get the two scrolls to match is to, on my 
original drawing, I only draw one scroll, like this bottom one that we're looking at here. I only draw it halfway, one half or the other half, and then trace that, flip the tracing over. So it's now it's a left-handed instead of a right-handed, put it in place, slip a piece of carbon paper underneath it, and trace that on there, and then transfer the the carbon lines into pencil lines. And that's how all the scroll designs at the top and at the bottom, and that's how the lettering got in, right? If I was doing this for a customer, for myself, I wouldn't bother writing the lettering in there, but since this was gonna be part of this workshop, I took the time to letter those. And the, the particle board works great, three quarter inch, particle board is really stiff. Um, the four by sheet, four by eight sheets, for some reason over the last 10 years have gotten a lot heavier than they used to be. Um, so they're a little more unwieldy for me. Five eights works great. And you can see that um, the top, everything's been kind of trimmed to where I don't have to lean over the table. I can stand in front of it and get wherever I want to on there. Okay. So I made little, um, I don't know what you call it, a storyboard or a layout for each of the scrolls. There's actually, I had prepared for the workshop, one of the big scroll on top and then another drawing of the little scroll by using the tracing paper and carbon paper. And I've worked out all the, the lengths from a, a reference point. So you, you can see on like the smallest scroll that's on the bottom, um, you can see right there by the, the pointer, it says quarter by three quarter, 22 and three quarter inches long. That's the cut length of the raw material. And then over on the other end, there's, uh, the other end of that scroll, there's a um, center punch marked on it and a line where from that center punch, seven and a quarter inches to the end of the raw material is where that reference point goes. And it says at the, to draw that out to eight inches and then make that scroll. And then the other end of it is 15 and a half inches long. And that's going to need to be drawn to 16 and a quarter once you have the square shape before you go to round on the half penny. And so that way, that scroll will fit in there like that. Um, and then I could hand that off to somebody and say, OK, here, Dennis, you make this one. You understand what's going on here? Victoria, you make this one. Mike, you make this one. And everybody can go off and make that. And then we put them all together. So there were several of these that would be passed out to different participants. So John, do you figure those lengths out by doing test pieces first? Yes. Yeah, I, okay. yes, exactly. It's, okay. Yeah, there was there was a whole lot of preparation for okay. this. And then if you know, then if you can keep track, you know, keep notes. I'm I always try to keep notes, but then when I go back to look at them, I don't know what I was talking about. So I end up redoing a lot of things because I didn't keep really good notes. But, and the and then that's another thing about with this particle board, like this, if I wanted to save this and do another sign bracket like this, maybe for something else or just use this scroll pattern, you know, I've got it, right? You know, I just saved the piece of wood and it doesn't take up much room. And I can go back, oh yeah, I'll make one of these. And now I've got all the work done or the um, practice done. So now we're getting ready to, begin 
Um, so there's eight upset square corners where it attaches to the post. Those are not true upset square corners. They're set down on the anvil with a shoulder and then folded up. But if someone's familiar enough with square corners, that is not much of a leap to go to there. And then there's also on the horizontal or the vertical ones, there's a upset square corner um, where the sign goes on. And that's so that the sign could fit in, set back into the bracket rather than be proud of it. And I didn't point that out in the, earlier in the drawings, there was a side view and it showed that, and I did not point that out then. So the, for me building this thing, the first step is always to build all the framework. And so I start with the two big pieces, which are three quarter inch square. Um, and they have the, the four tabs that are folded up like square corners. And so since our constraints are pretty loose, you know, we came up with the number of 47 and a half for the overall length. Um, so it doesn't have to fit into an existing framework. So we basically have three times to make three of the four times I call like free. Because they, they don't act. You want them to be perfect, but if, if the two bars came out instead of 47 and three quarters, if they came out 47 and five eighths, Nobody's going to care what in this situation. What has to happen, though, is they have to be the same length. So I can take one bar, do one end of it, check and see, OK, did, did, it, did it come out the way I planned it to come out? Yeah, it did. And then I can, or no, it didn't. And then I can take the second bar and do one end of it and compare the two. And oh, this one's a little bit longer. Maybe I need to trim a little bit off and you know redo the other ends. So, and then the third one, which is going to be the second end of one of the bars, it, you get that one to do. And the one that really matters is the fourth one. But you've practiced it three times and hopefully you got it down. And there you go. But, you know, I wouldn't, if I had two like this to do, <clears throat> I'd do one end of each first before I do two ends of one and be comparing them as I go along. Um, I'm going to have to say Weaverville is lucky to have you, John. So. Nice work, real nice work. Okay, thank you. Um, so then we're that's the four corners, and we'll we will see a video of one of those being made um, a little bit later. Um, right after this slide, actually. Oh well, then let's go to that. Never mind. We have some still oh, photos first. Yeah, there's a couple of stills here. This is where I'm setting down the end i'm going to flatten the end of it to three eighths and keep the regular bar three quarters of an inch you can you may be able to see under the hammer on the picture on the left a light chalk line that was where to for me to index the bar you can see it a little better on the other picture but you need to keep it tight up against the anvil and then flatten it there I, was not concerned about it getting wider there. I thought that would be kind of a, a nice element if it was wider than the three quarters. I did want to um, chamfer the corners and chamfer the edge that's facing in toward the sign. So I think we'll get, oh, and then once you get it, set down, then it's a matter of just folding that back and squaring up the corner. 
And here's a couple of still shots of doing that. And that's kind of all the upsetting that you're doing is going into the three quarter bar. So that the three quarters is getting distorted and it doesn't doing this type of uh, an end treatment doesn't give you much of an opportunity. You, on a square corner, you go from both sides of the corner, both directions and doing this, you're only going from one direction. So you have to keep the, the three quarter bar kind of under control. And I don't know what those two red lines mean. That was, um, you can kind of see, you can kind of see. That maybe the shoulder is not really edges are, there. They're coming together there to make a crisp corner. That's what those are supposed to be. Okay. And this is champ for the edges because all the all this material I um, knocked down the the corners um, under the power hammer to give it a more forged look and um, and also chamfering the bars makes the collars work a lot better. So I like to continue that whatever chamfer I have in it, you want to, that to continue around the corner. And there, that's just kind of cleaning up and sharpening up that corner a little bit. And so here we go. Champ for the corners. And that's that's kind of an ups. It's putting putting a chamfer on the end, but it's also kind of upsetting it so that it kind of. I'm trying to get it to kind of roll forward a little bit. Nice shirt, John. <laughs> I wore that for you, Dennis. So you're really only getting the opportunity to upset from that direction. Because if I tried from the other way, I can't clamp it in the vise. So this is this is getting the three quarter inch back into three quarter inch. And you can notice the, the motion of the hammer. I'm trying to draw that corner down. I'm trying to draw that material down. It's, it's kind of a wiping blow rather than a straight blow. Same thing with a, a regular upset square corner. You don't want to go square until the very end. And you really should keep the face of your anvil cleaner than that. And here we're putting the finishing touches on, getting the three quarter bars back to three quarter square. That's just to kind of clean up the sides since they spread out. Just try to make them look even. And yeah, you can, and you can really bit, you can see the little bit of upset on the very tip of the tab there, and that's what I was going for with that. Awesome! I love it. Nice. Okay, now the next thing you do to that bar is um, punch and drift the holes for the tenons. And here's the shot of the finished 
um, hole and a tenon. And you'll notice um, on the edges of the hole, there look, there's some nick marks in there. And those are intentional, put in with a chisel. Um, that side of the bar would be the side that's going to get headed. So that if this were to be joined together, that would need to be rolled over 180 degrees so that the head is on the side of the, the um, little chisel marks. And that way, when you set the tenon, material will spread into those and lock into those little chisel marks and it will not be able to spin. And that'll lock that bar in there and it won't be able to rotate inside the hole. That's tricky. So you put yeah. the rivet, the head of the rivet goes on this side. Yes, the head of the rivet is going to go on the side of the um, with the nicks in it, and we'll we'll see that later when it gets it's getting fit fit up. Cool. Is that I, I never spinning? Thought of that. that spinning is a problem. Yeah, it can be. Yeah, and so that solves that problem, and it's real simple to do. You may have to. Um, it does upset into the hole a little bit, so you might have to stick run a file through there to make sure your tenon will go back back through. But it it does help to um, on lock this inside that here from rotating. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so these are the um, slot punch and drifts used. Um, the slot punch is made in the double D tool um, design to be held with tongs and used. I use it under the treadle hammer. It's an eighth by half uh, slot and it's made out of NASCAR axle. And then there's three drifts there. And he's, one, the small one is five sixteenths and the, the other two are um, three eighths drifts. And you're gonna say, John, why did you use two three eighths drifts that are different lengths? Um, stay tuned, <laughs> you'll find out later. So we've got a layout where we want the center of the um, hole to be, and that was the seven and five eighths plus the three and three quarters is 11 and three eighths. And so I've got a mark on there at 11 and three eighths from the outside of the uh, end of the bar. And so the chalk line closest to you is the center of the hole. And then I, since it's a half inch um, punch, I've moved over a quarter of an inch and that's where I make the center punch mark. So that when this comes out of the fire and sets on the anvil, I can line up my punch. I can set the edge of the punch right on the center of the hole where I can see it rather than covering it up with the punch and hoping that it stayed in the right place. And then I use local heat, rosebud, um, and punch the hole under the treadle hammer. And I think we have a video of that. Or there's, there's the finished hole. It looks a little bit off, but by the time it's done, you won't know. And then once the hole's punched, upset it into roughly round. And I use the base of my anvil for the upsetting block. And there's after upsetting. And then it's a matter of drifting the hole. And you can control that swelling by with the heat you can get one side to move more than the other and here's a uh, drift going through and there's the finished hole
here come the wedges out of the treadle hammer. Oh, oh I edited that out. Oh, okay, thank you. So I got a question. Yes. Um, your treadle hammer. Uh, do you use your treadle hammer a lot? Yes. Okay. So you would recommend everybody getting one? Well, I don't know. Um, I use it a lot. I'm really glad I had it. It's a homemade um, piece. I would I would be kind of lost with see here's why there's three drifts. The one that was supposed to finish it was too short. So I had to knock it through with another one. And I don't know why Greg showed all three of those. It should have been just the two drifts, but <laughs> can I get that in writing you, you that everybody needs a treadle hammer? Well, I didn't say everybody needs a treadle hammer. <laughs> Um, Dennis a, did. Yeah, I think very, that was Dennis. It's a, it's an extremely handy tool, extremely because if you want to hold work and hold a tool and hit it, and don't have a striker, you know your only other option is putting it between your legs and doing it over the anvil. Which, you know, I've done a lot of things like that, but the treadle hammer is just a lot easier. It's controllable. It's controllable. Yeah, it's much more controllable. And, you know, if I had a striker for that, I'd have done it with a, a striker. But, I, you know, a striker is, for me, I got to call up Mark and say, can you be yeah, over here right. in five Where's minutes? Mark? No, you can't. Well, I'm going to go on without you then. Right. So it's a safety, a safety issue then. That's, yeah. that's the angle. That's, the that's angle. a good angle. Absolutely. <laughs> well... Yeah, so I would I would recommend only one, um, but it, you know it depends on your shop, your situation, what you're doing. Um, you know, it's like a power hammer. Does everybody need a power hammer? Once you have a power hammer, you don't ever want to go without it again. Yeah, but right. Does ev right. does everybody need one? You know, if you're working out of your, your garage or a small space, you know, and limited with, you know, your electrical situation, um, that's, you know, I don't think everybody needs a power hammer. I think, you know, all this could have, all this could have been done without the use of a treadle hammer or a power hammer. Um, but it's just a lot more sweat and elbow grease. Well said, well said. So is yours for sale? The treadle hammer? Yeah. No. No. Once I have it, <laughs> I, I can't live without it. If I didn't have it, I wouldn't know what I was missing, I guess. But I, I do. Put, my, uh, put a piece of tape with my name on it then. Oh, I already saw where you marked it. Okay. You sound like my wife when she finally got a car with power windows. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's like rolling up the windows. You've been doing it all the time and oh now all I gotta just push this button. I don't want the hand crank anymore. <laughs> and it's like a hand crank on your forge. If if your forge is a hand crank and then you put a blower on it, you go, Oh, why would I want a hand crank if I can use electricity for it? So it's it's just where you are in your shop and the kind of work you're doing and um, but if, if all I had was a forge and an anvil and, um, hand tooling, I would get a treadle hammer before I would get a power hammer. John, did you, changing subjects, did you account for a change in the length of the bar when you punched it? Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask that. I thought about that today. Somebody's going to ask that. Um, 
And I thought about it and I, I, you know, this was a year and a half ago and was actually two years ago that I actually built these. Um, I believe I took that into consideration and checked to see what the shrinkage would be in the bar and was, was not concerned because, you know, as long as all four holes shrunk the same, you know, it's not a problem for this, but I don't recall how much there was. There, there seems to have to be shrinkage because the slot punch was a half inch long and now the hole is three quarters of an inch, or I'm sorry, the slot punch was a half inch long and now the hole is three eighths of an inch diameter. So in my mind, it should have, each one should have shrunk an eighth of an inch. So the whole overall length should have shrunk a quarter of an inch. But I, I think I recall checking that and it, there was almost no shrinkage at all. Okay, so, but you've, you've already made the tabs on both ends of the bar at this point. Right. So you, you just got to make sure that the links match up. Right. Right. Got it. Yeah. And th those posts are not set in the concrete yet. So I knew the way they were going to do this was bolt the sign onto the post and then put the post in the, in the ground. So, you know, there was, you know, if that changed an inch or two inches, you know, they didn't care. If it were to fit into an existing opening, it would have made a difference. And it might have made sense to punch the holes first, if that were the case, or to factor in, punch a hole and see how much it did shorten. But I, I don't recall um, that, it, that it, if it shrunk at all, it didn't shrink very much, but I can't. Um, I don't have a recollection of that, but that is something to consider. And I thought about, oh, somebody's going to ask that question, and I don't know the answer. But that's a it's a really good question, and that's something that that um, I'm sure I took into consideration. But how it affected it, I can't remember. So now we got the hole for the tenon. Now we need to make, so the top bars are done, the top and bottom bar at this point is done. And we'll go to the vertical bars. And they're gonna have this upset square corner and then a really tight bend and then a tenon on the end of that. So the upset square corner is, you know, a nice local heat. If, if you don't have a torch, you know, you're quenching and spending a lot of time um, dealing with that. But you just make your first bend. And then I always check to make sure that the two parts are still 90 degrees to each other. And if they're not, fix it now before you get too far. And if I if I think it's they're going crooked again as I'm working it, you know, I'll stop and get them back on the same plane. And it's just bend a nice bend. Put you put your center punch marks on the center of the bend and I put the center punch marks on both sides. So when it's upside down and I'm working at the other leg, I still can see the center punch mark. And this is not sure where we are here for getting close to square and cleaning up the, the um, yeah, you can, corners. You can, you can see the 
the lines are closing in on each other for your sharp corner. And here, I think we're just getting the chamfer all the way back into the corners. And here you see a nice sharp line. Yeah, and I think I think this is the final getting it to square. And then we are going to see a video on on the square corner. Or maybe not. Um, it's right after this part. Oh, OK. Like a couple more stills and then the video. OK, so this is a quick little jig um, to make that real tight radius bend that's that close to the square corner. And the side at the corner that where two flat bars are welded together, the face of the flat bar nearest me is on the same line as uh, the face of the square corner that's nearest me. And so that keeps everything in a straight line on that plane. And then the angle iron is, is welded there um, to keep hold everything in place. And this way I can just push that corner up to the, the flat bar, clamp it in place, and then um, make the bend. And you can, okay. Here's your video. Here's the video. And it's, again, it's the as short a heat as you can get on there. Makes a tighter bend to start with. And it's real easy to get those, that bend out of whack. You don't want to bend all the way to 90. And here we're checking to make sure things are good and this is this is to correct for the um, twist in it this kind of correction needs to be done as soon as you realize it don't Think it's don't think it's going to go away or get better on its own. It's only going to make things worse. And you want to hang on to the end end of it so that it doesn't bend over ninety. You don't want to go to ninety degrees until the very end. Otherwise, you can end up with a cold shunt and a crack. John, this is amazing, but I'm so distracted by how clean your shop is. <laughs> it's it's like could we come have breakfast there or something on the floor. It's awesome. Well, I <laughs> I like to work in a clean shop. You get stuff all over the floor, it's you end up slipping around on the concrete. And yeah. I just like having things nice and tidy. That's Not awesome. always like this. I, <laughs> So here we are clamping that in, bending fork, just pull that around. It's gotta be nice and tight. You don't wanna get too much heat too far out from there. We're gonna see what happens with that in a minute. Then get it all the way over there and hang on to it for a minute. You can put a clamp on there. You don't wanna just get it up to where it touches the edge of the, jig and let it go because it will spring back a little bit. The heat will cause it to spring back. So, you know, when you, you get over there, hold it for a few seconds or put another pair of ice grips on there and let it cool for a second um, so that it, it stays the same. You'll notice the two, if we go back to the um, previous picture, no, the next the next one after this. No, no, I'm sorry, the other direction. This one or that was the video. I can show the video again. 
and I can oh, speed no, it up. I, I just wanted to point out the, the bending forks there that were when it got bent over all the way here and oh you can see from this picture these two different bending forks I'm using. I have a series of those that that start with I don't know maybe three quarters of an inch and then go up to maybe two and a half inches or something. They're real handy for working with jigs. You can pull stuff tight with it, use them for scrolling, shaping scrolls, um, a lot of little bending things. These are made from leaf spring. You just heated up leaf spring, flatten it out, um, and then torch cut the shape out of it and cleaned them up and ground the inside, made sure the inside of the forks were nice and parallel and rounded. You don't want any sharp edges in there at all. You know, all the work. But these things, I made these years ago and they're great. They hold up to any kind of abuse. They don't open up or spread. Um, they're not as pretty as the ones that um, a lot of people make, but, and I had a real pretty one that Dennis made, uh, but these things work work great and there there's not much to it to make them you harden them or are they just no it's just leaf spring just let them air cool i just i just took the the leaf spring were were not the tapered springs they were flat and i heated them up and flattened them because they got that curve to them and then just cut them with a torch and then went back and ground the you know the torch cut and and the it's not critical what the inside dimensions are because there, i have i think i have a series of like six of them or something and just clean them up just make sure they're um parallel on the inside and they didn't they don't need any heat treat or anything they're they're tough as spring Spring steel makes great tools because you don't have to heat treat it. So this, you can see how the jig worked here, but you can see this one, this is one of the original practice pieces that um, didn't get bent as tight as it needed to be. And I could have gone back and worked that corner a little bit, but this is, the, the heat got too close to the tenon end on there. And that's, I see a lot of people trying to bend things like around, a, trying to make a circle by bending around a pipe or something like that. And they get the heat too far from where that they want it to bend. And then it, you know, it bends on its own. And that's what happened here. The heat was, was too close to, to where we're looking at it. And uh, it goes, you know, it goes the easy way. You have to keep the heat back toward the corner, to the square corner, and then it'll bend tighter. And you can see the, the funky one with, with the good one. And if they were all, if the four of these were all funky, it, it'd be fine. But you wouldn't want to use those two together. And you can see this, the, the center punch marks were on there, but for the square corner. So they came out pretty, pretty close. They look so good. I mean, the, the whole, how you did it looks very pleasing. Very. Which, which well, one's the funky, which one's the funky one? I think well, the top. The bottom one, one. It, the, the curve is too big. That bottom oh, one okay. is the one Not that bad. was, that was open on the jig where the top one was the one that's tight to the jig. Some more acute angle then, okay. Yeah, right. and like I say, for as long as they're all the same, either right. one is fine. Right. But you don't want to put those two together. And if if you had um, the sharp bend at one end of this bar and the bigger bend at the other, now the sign is not going to be parallel to the rest of the sign. If you understand because so either are fine just they have to be 
They have to be um, the same. Exactly. Yeah. And the okay. one I was wanting is the one on top. Hmm. Okay. I like the one on the bottom. Well, you can have it. It's laying in the shop somewhere. Didn't get used. <laughs> but in that in that picture, um, I did want to bring up that the sign being 12 inches, the corner of the sign needs to sit right in there. And I left enough room. Well, the sign sits in the other part. Yeah, where the that's where the sign is going to go in there. And I left enough room, I think it's like 12 and an eighth or so inside the bend, so that the wood wouldn't have to be trimmed to get in there. And the, so anyway, that may not mean anything. So well, it's all so stuff you have to think, think about. But that was one, that's one of the constraints. The sign is 12 inches tall. So, you know, if those two bends on the, on that bar were too tight, then the sign's not gonna fit inside of it. And we're gonna have to, you know, sand off part of the sign or something like that. So in that situation, you know, I made it a little bit big so that the sign would fit in there and you wouldn't notice that it's not jammed right into the, the corners there. Right, but, uh, I can't remember, did they give you, did you have the actual wooden sign or did, did Rod Blue just say, hey, this is the dimension? No, he just gave me the dimensions. I did not see the sign until um, we got to Weaverville. I, okay. I don't I don't remember if he gave me a photograph. He might have sent a photograph of it, but you know, I was going off his dimensions, which I never like to trust somebody else to it's 12 inches to somebody is 12 and a sixteenth to somebody else. Right, right. So anyway, yeah, I just went off of his dimensions. So the next step, once those four um, corners are made, is the tenons. And it's a 3 8 inch tenon on the um, end of a 3 8 bar. And again, like the, like the mounting tabs on the 3 quarter bars, as long as shoulder to shoulder is the same length and inside the the bends, the square corners is the same length, then it doesn't really matter if they're longer or shorter than the drawing shows. But we want to get it right on there. So here, we're just laying out the, the shoulder of the tenon. And there, bring the line all the way around and then it Top picture, I've drawn the sides of the tenon because with this, um, this tenon, it, it could be done certainly with um, fullers at the top and the bottom and then draw that out to a 3 8 round. Um, by cutting it this way, it saves on the monkeying part of it, helps to keep the you don't have to monkey it so much because if you use a fuller to um, set the shoulder, you're sucking part of the material down in there and to get that back out to a square, you have to monkey that out there. And, you know, maybe you're gonna end up shortening one bar too short. So with the, you know, and keeping in it in mind, you know, doing this in Weaverville. Um, and this is the way I would do it in my shop. I just cut, laid that out on all four sides and cut that with a cutoff wheel on, a, on an angle grinder. And then I was also able to cut the octagon. So in a matter of a minute or two, you know, the bottom picture is where I was and the tenon is almost done. 
Those are some mad angle grinder skills. Well, I once I found out about uh, um, cutoff wheels. That was life changing. When I you when were, I you were in started, love. Yes, when I was in this trade, we used nine nine inch grinding wheels on the great big metal grinders. There were no such thing as these four and a half inch little Dewalt grinders, and you ground everything with that. And those were a monster. Getting these little ones that, and you could put a five inch cutoff wheel on there. It's like, oh man, this is great. So that's saw the tenon on the, and you do that with a hacksaw as well or you could even saw the shoulder and then forge back the rest of it but it helps to keep a nice shoulder that's not going to need a whole lot of monkeying and so here's then the that um, octagon can go get heated up and go right into the um, swage to round up the tenon and then there's the monkey tool to clean it up and there you go and I think there's a video there we go you see how it turned 90 degrees turn 90 de now we're going and then, then once you feel that you can move it, spin it around inside there, then you're at the, the finished dimension. And then there's not too much monkey to this, so I'm not gonna shorten it too much. So is this in the cutoff wheel legal for the level two um, tenants? I believe it is. You, cool. you, you can use a drill press to drill. No, you don't drill holes in that one, do you? No, it would be best if you forged it. Okay. Got it. <laughs> but it is another skill set, right? Because using that so that, and not cutting all the way through that is tricky. And it's it's not not everyone has the that and yeah that's it does yeah. take it does take a little there is a skill set involved with using um, grinders and and especially cutoff wheels it, and they they are kind of a hazard because if you're looking at that line the sparks are going right in the same plane as your eyeball sure. And having having stuff dug out of your eye, as I have in the past, is not much fun. But if you get to the same endpoint, but I understand what Victoria said. It's kind of the process of learning. Right. But it's just there's so little material to move that anyway. Yeah, we, we can talk more about that later. It, it's... It's not an absolute, but you should be able to do the foraging for sure. And uh, like I said, a way to um, help with that would be to instead of use a fuller to start the tannin, you could use a um, hacksaw and cut down to that and then just then you're not going to pull the shoulder in so much. Yeah. And and Mike Mumford put in the chat, glad to know I'm not the only Smith who cuts tenons. <laughs> oh, so, oh, there's, you know, and I came up in a shop where um, we did miles of, hand, I built miles of handrails in my time and it's a it, production shop and you do what's you get there the fastest way that you can and yeah it's nice to you know to do everything by hand in this um 
with this project, if I was doing this for a customer, um, we'll talk about this on the next session, but um, I put TIG welds under where the collars go to hold things in place and to build strength into it. And yeah, that's not traditional, but is it traditional to use a, a drill press to drill a hole for a, a tenon or a rivet? Is it non-traditional to have electric lights in your shop? You know, where it's almost like where do you draw the line on on that? And yeah, for these um, for your your grill, I would say yes, the best thing to do would be to forge it. But for a workshop where this needs to get done in two days. This is a, a quick way we can get save some time. Yeah, it's another valid skill set. Absolutely. So the incised twist. Um, this was, if you may remember from the layout, it uh, the, this is the part of the bevel scroll, and it had that um, twist part way up, and. We had the layout marks there so we could put a center punch mark at the six and three quarter and 11 and three quarter mark. And then just draw a line down the center of the bar. And I use a um, fairly sharp fuller. It's not a chisel point, it's a, but it's a um, fairly sharp fuller. And I do this under the treadle hammer yeah. And then you can, you know, I just go one direction once and then go back to clean up any of the tool marks. Um, but also, if you want to do, once you get the line set in there, heat it up and deepen it. Same technique I use on the collars. You see, the collars later all have a line punch down. So, when John and I were looking at this video um, for like a dry rehearsal, I asked him about his hand under the treadle hammer, and he said, Well, I'll let you say what you said. <laughs> <laughs> As, as long as you're punching straight down, as long as you're holding the tool straight um, and you're keeping, you, you might have seen at the end here, I got really close to the edge and that was kind of scaring me watching it right now. Um, so you need to keep under the hammerhead, but, you know, I've had it glance out of my hand a couple of times and by the time, you know, it, it's never caused any real damage. Um, I'm comfortable doing it. If you're more comfortable with a handle on it, certainly put a handle on it. I feel like for following that line like that, I have much better control with the tool in my hand rather than a handle. Yeah, and you would always use a handle under the power hammer, but you have- Yeah, I would not do that under the power. I would, I won't put my fingers between power hammer dies ever. Um, and the treadle hammer is not hitting with the same power as a power hammer. Uh, what about a fly press? Yeah, a fly press would be great. I don't have a fly press. I've often thought of getting one, but um, my treadle hammer works great. Yeah. The thing with the fly press, you, you can't hold the work and the tool at the same time. You've got to get one hand free. Get, what you got to have one hand free to to work the fly press run the press exactly interesting yeah but you, you'd put the die in in the fly press so it would be attached to the to the ram of the fly press right and then you have to have a, a guide to Twice. hold your 
material up against. Right, some sort of fence. And then you have to make sure that that guide is set securely. You have to, you know, and and down the center. Hold like this. And so by the time you by the time you have your fly press set up, I've already finished and moved on. As far as I'm concerned, with the treadle hammer. Force my hand down, just you know. So, so, and then you want to do both sides of that um, section, and you could go back. Like I say, once you get the that line established in there, you could heat it up and go back, and you want to use a handle tool for this that part of it, and um, deepen that line to make it pop a little more. And so once you get the line in, um, again, I use the local heat with the torch and twist it. And with these scrolls, I twisted one uh, clockwise and the other one counterclockwise. And I clamped the same section of the bar, either the long section or the short section in the vise to do the twist so that the if there was any imperfection in the twist, it would uh, be symmetrical because the, um, the vise is going to be a bigger heat sink than your twisting wrench. So the section that's closest to the vise is not going to twist as fast as the section that's closer to the tool. So that's something that you have to pay attention to when you're twisting something, if you want an even twist. Sometimes that kind of spirally looking twist is, is a great effect. Um, but if you're looking for an even twist, you may need to stop before you're done twisting and put a little more heat on the part that's going slower, or maybe pour a little water on the part that's going too fast. Um, so that's just twisting tricks. Okay, so now we've got, um, we're gonna make the bottom scroll section here. And the first thing to do, we've worked out the length of the, of the material um, and know where the twist is going to be so the first thing to make this piece is to put the twist um, in the center first and then we're going to partially scroll both ends because if you scroll it all the way you won't be able to make the the uh forge well okay so there's there's the finished piece and here's you wouldn't have, or would yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't have either. I thought I did. I didn't get that. Um, Sean, did you have? Were you adding to the thing or just talking? I think that was a kind of a bleed over. Okay. So you can see there the the middle of the bar is twisted, and you can see the chalk marks that are the register marks um, at 12 inches apart. And so the first, the easiest thing to do in this situation is the scroll on the end and then um, make the bend and the forge weld. And again, you can see the, the whole layout on that. Um, little piece of wood that tells a story on um, you need a total length of 31 and a half inches and where everything needs to be. So I like how you laid that out. That's pretty cool. And that's how I would do, you know, I would do this if I was doing this for you know, a client or whatever. I, right, right. I wouldn't make these little individual ones. All this would be on 
the actual layout or on a, a hand drawn little notebook thing and it wouldn't be you know perfectly drawn it, it would say it would have the, the notes on there and maybe not the, the picture like that right well it describes it nicely and and that way i can hand a bar to the 31 and a half inch long bar to somebody and say make this right and they can go oh yeah okay right Good, yeah nice So we'll start that ribbon scroll. Oh my gosh. Um, matching scroll hints. You can see these two scrolls are the same scroll, but they, they don't really match. Um, if you're doing a, a bunch of them, and like I say, most of my experience has been, you know, there might be. 20 of these, I, I go ahead and make 20 of them from start to finish and then go back and pair them up if they're going to be in pairs or or four together or whatever and say, okay, these, these are the four biggest, fattest ones. They're going to be a group. And these are the four smallest ones and they're going to be a group and go that way. But um, if I'm doing something like... Um, for the level three grill where you're making those, the four blown over leaf scrolls and the bevel scrolls, it's like, I will make them up to a certain point and then stop and go make the next one up to that point and see how they match. And maybe, you know, I would do this snub in scroll up to where it's, it's the squared shape and then stop and make the other one next to the, up to the squared shape and oh one's bigger than the other well i can file off two sides of one to get to get a better uh, outcome at the end it's not efficient to be you know setting one aside and letting it cool and then it's got to get heated up again later but you get a better finished piece And the, the ribbon scroll is the simplest scroll, and it's the one I use 90% of the time on things. And it's simply draw a taper on the bar and, and then forge the, the start of the scroll over the anvil, and then you can go to a scroll jig. Is this a video? Okay. okay. No, nope, that was just pictures of you. Okay. Again, I did this one under the power hammer. And is 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 it okay to use a power hammer on your level two grill? Just saying. It's just a rhetorical question. You, if you you no, you should make them all by hand, um, and you can use a scrolling jig if you've made it yourself. Hmm. Okay. So for this, I drew this down with the power hammer. Um, Greg showed up at my shop at nine o'clock on a Saturday and we did the whole shooting match in one day. He left at six and we never stopped for lunch. So time constraint was a factor in some of these shortcuts that I took. So from the the drawing it out to a um, drawing the taper this is how to start the scroll over the edge of the anvil it looks like i'm hammering into the corner of the anvil but what's happening here is that hammer is going straight up and down and it's just brushing against the tip of the the scroll there you don't want to be forging the scroll you're pushing it you're not pinching it ever against the anvil at this point. You're just getting it to curve over the, the edge of the anvil. And then once you've gotten it curved, you can go to the scroll jig. And this is a little 
starter jig that um, helps me with the with the scrolls that I have, the jigs that I have. If I start them on this little starter, then they will drop down into the larger scroll jig and be able to go all the way around. If you don't have the scroll scrolled far enough, it may not go onto your jig, the type of jigs that I have that I can talk about um, another jig, but it'll be hard to explain without seeing a picture of it. Um, so, and then here we go from the one to, to this jig. And then if I'm doing multiples, you know, once the first one, okay, this is as far as I want to go on this jig. If I keep going, it's going to be not going to fit the drawing. So I need to know where to stop with it. And since I'm making two of them, I just put a little, you know, a mark on there. That's, that's where I want to stop. And I can check that on the drawing or the layout. So you want to set that edge down first. And then draw your taper. That's just getting everything back parallel. Just cleaning it up, put getting that chamfer back on the edges. And then here we are, just just little glancing blows. Feet just keep feeding it out and hitting it. A little harder as you go. And there you go. And I'm really mostly concerned about just that tip. And by putting it on the edge of the anvil instead of the face, I can see what's happening to it when I hit it. If I'm hitting down on to it, it's harder to see what effect the hammer's having on it. Another heat. We, you can see how it needed to be scrolled far enough to get past the end of that jig. Because I can use that same jig and make a, a great big scroll, or I can make a smaller one like this on it. Now we're going to. Um, bend that and do the forge weld, which is the same one as a level one gate latch. Just folding it back on itself and welding it to itself. A little flux and then the picture on the right, I've got a, like, it's just a narrow poker. It just goes down to a point and I can, Put it in the fire and it'll heat up to forging temperature really quick and if it's wants to stick to the piece i want to forge well then that lets me know that i'm getting to the right temperature and then weld it together
with Lux. I always weld with Lux. It's a crutch, I know, but. I think flux is fine. <laughs> I'll take that extra second or two. You can see how that scroll needed to stay way back out of the way and able to, for me to be able to work that end out there. Must have done that twice because I don't know how we got the yeah. <clears throat> opposite view of the weld there. Yeah, it looks like you're just continuing the uh, taper. And you'd always want to take that back to welding heat to keep the weld. Right. And then now I'll finish scrolling that scroll and then put a curve into towards the center section of the bar. And when you're doing that, you want to make sure that you protect that weld. Finish the scroll. You don't want to just pull it around there now because you're liable to rip open your weld. So I'm using the, the forks and then now I've gone to a bigger fork. Okay, now I'm going to dash over there to the layout. Okay. Really nice, John. Really nice. Uh, does anybody have any comments questions yeah let yourselves back in no that's right. that's awesome i mean other than the math <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the math, yeah. the um, math is is tedious um but i found if i just start throwing that um proportion around i can get get to where I want to be a lot quicker. And there's, you can actually, I'm sure you can buy them. There's a, there's a tricky little thing. It's similar to a, it's just two pieces of, of metal with a rivet in it. And when you open one to one inch, the, the other end goes to one and 0.62, or you open this to two inches. And so it, you don't have to use so much math. You just set one side and, and the other side tells you what it's going to be. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, awesome. I mean, great, great on the mechanics of doing the, the, uh, the piece. I enjoyed it. Other than your clean shop, which kind of bothers me. Oh, <laughs> everybody gets to work brief, now. brief about it. <laughs> if you want to work in a dirty, messy shop, go right ahead. <laughs> No, I love it. Thank you so much. Well, um, I got a couple questions I'm going to throw at you, not necessarily on your project, but uh, um, welding multiple pieces or forge welding multiple pieces. Um, do you go over to the tack or do you go over to the welder and tack them? I mean, I know the answer, but it's yeah. You're just trying to make me look bad, huh? Yeah, I'm trying to, yes, right. 
Yes, I have done drop tong welds. Uh, in fact, at, during one of these uh, Weaverville hammer ins that Mark always teaches, Mark Asprey always teaches a uh, instructor training class the Thursday before. And this one, this was quite a few years ago on tongs and it was doing the tongs with a drop tong weld in it. And I made six pairs of tongs on the site there. I think I was there, yeah. So I've done it with, when I do that in my shop, I'm more liable to go over and put a little tack on it before I attempt to weld it. If, right. if I have a second person there that can hold one of the pieces, I'm a little more confident, but generally on something like that, that I'm gonna forge weld together, I've got a lot of time invested in in it and I don't want to risk losing sure. it. Right. And well, I don't think that's making I mean, you look bad. I think that's a perfectly acceptable way to go, especially if you're using like a propane forge. Um you can rivet it and then yeah, and that's it. that's another way you can drill and rivet it. Um and I've done that in the past and then well but the I mean, rivet falls apart. I mean, it, it all loosens up when it gets hot. And... Right. Uh, this, <laughs> well, this I meant question... rivet and then weld it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I've done that. Put, a, put the two pieces together and then rivet it together and then weld it. And then I've had the, the three pieces. Now you've got two, two pieces you're trying to weld and the rivet and they all get hot and swell up and now they're all flopping around. Oh, okay. Right. So, um, well, so, so this, when I was demonstrating for the NWBA, this question came up and I said, Hey, yeah, I, I just go over and I I'll tack weld them because I'm trying to make a living and I got a bunch of this stuff to go through. And Daryl Nelson was right next to me and he said, isn't that what we all do? So yeah. And if, you if know, Darryl, if, you... if Daryl Nelson does it, then it's okay. <laughs> then it's yeah, right. But it, I got a pass. If this is some, if this is something you're doing, say for your grill, and with the, with the level three, all the, those drop down welds, I did, drop down weld because that's the way, that needed to be done. But if I'm doing something for a client that you know I need to have done by the end of this week, and I'm already, spent more hours on it than. I bid, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to right. get to the end that I sure need to success. get to. Yeah. yeah, a sure success. Right, right. So, you know, I'm not going to just weld it together and grind it off and call it good, you know, if it's supposed to be a forge welded piece like that. Right, right. Uh, well, yeah. I think this is good for everybody to hear that um in certain you know circumstances or maybe you're learning how to forge weld there's nothing wrong with tack welding something together and learning how to forge weld in my view right so i'm sure victor i'm gonna get a ration from victoria later <laughs> uh, no I mean i've given had that forge welding talk and I I experimented with all of them. I tack welded, I riveted, yeah. it, I did it all. Um right. the the thing is you wanna you want to take shortcuts once you know how to do it thoroughly and you're gonna learn that by doing it by hand and then you can start to take shortcuts. But I wouldn't want to try to use a power hammer if I didn't know how to make a taper. Like that, you're just not going to be able to get there. Your power hammered piece is going to look not like a taper. Right. Well, right. yeah, it's definitely good to know your hand hand skills, handheld skills before approaching the power hammer skills. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, in, and in this case, for if you're working on level two level work, you should 
have learned how to do a, a simple taper by now. Yeah. And if if you haven't, if you can't do a, a taper by hand, then you know, maybe you better go to a different workshop in <laughs> or, in, in this or, situation. Or, or, or sign up for Mark Asprey's class. Yeah, because this, you know, this event to me was, you know, not for beginners. This is for people that are, you know, level two that have right. that have done these scrolls. Maybe they they're not, you know, ready to do the grill, but they've they know the steps on making these scrolls, or they have done their grill, and it's like okay. Let's go back and use these skills that you thought you'd never use again because you don't ever want to make a scroll and you think they're out of date and stupid. But hey, if you're going to be a blacksmith, and somebody comes to you and says, "Make this for me," uh, you're going to go. Put your oh no, I don't like on. to do that. That's it's not what I like to do. Well, <laughs> then do what you like to do. But if you want to make a a dollar at it, you're going to say. Yeah, I'll make that. I can do that. And then you go back to your shop and scratch your head and go, what have I got myself into? And then then you really learn something. But this it's yeah. a way to develop the skills and then use the skills and not just, okay, oh, I did that already. I already know how to do that. Well, show me. Do right it again. Right. I asked you a question about your scroll jigs. Yes. Uh, you had, uh, I noticed your starter jig and then your larger jig, you know, sometimes I've done that. Sometimes I've seen them where they're spiral up. Right. Starters kind of, you know what I'm talking about? What's, yes. the, what's your choice of doing one type of jig versus the other? The one that I showed in here is the one that I made in, would have been 19... 88 or 89 when I learned how to make scrolls and that's how I learned how to make them I worked in a shop that um, it was a, a union it was a major production shop we had 30 30 to 40 guys in the shop generally I worked in the ornamental and miscellaneous side where we did a lot of handrails the company had been started by um, an Italian immigrant, and so there was always an Italian smith working there. We didn't do a lot of ornamental work, forge work, but he did it all of it. And it was basically it was ribbon scrolls, rivets, and collars, and twists. And so I learned scrolling from him. And I got started in this. And, and so that's the way I learned. That's the way that's always worked for me. The, the type of jig that you're talking about, I have a few of those. I've made a few. And then you can, it's a one jig fits all kind of. You can start. Um, the center of the jig is taller than the main body of the jig. So you can start your scroll with tongs at the top and get part way around and then drop it down till it fits down into the jig. It's, it's a little harder to explain um, if, if you're not familiar with that type of jig, but um, those work well, but this is, you know, this is the way I've been doing it and this is the way that works for me. And that's why I do it that way. The advantage I see of, you know, I've got both in my shop and the advantage I see is you don't have to flatten. A lot of times the scroll gets spiraled when you make it and you got to go back, flatten it. Oh yeah. And that, that happens in, in the flat jigs as well. It'll get, it gets cattywampus in there and you have to, you know, just lay it on the anvil and flatten it down. But yeah, it, it would be, that would be more of a problem in that because you have to be parallel to the bottom of the jig the whole time till you get to the bottom of the jig. So yeah, that would be a problem there. 
I got another question. Um, hand hammers. What's your favorite style of hand hammer? I mean, I know your. I know that your favorite sledgehammer. <laughs> Well, that's the one you made him. The one that Dennis and Brett made for me. It's um, rounded on one side and flat on the other side, and that's the hammer I used most during during the demo here. Um, I I like um, the shape of the hammer to be the face of the hammer to be round rather than square. So that if I want to like dig in with the heel of the hammer, I don't have, you know, I can come in at, at an angle and dig sure. in with that. So where, like a big full, yeah. Where if it's a square head, now you're coming in with a corner rather than um, a rounded edge. Right. And I find I don't really use a cross peen very much. Um, I like the round, like a rounding hammer, the round face um, to spread things more. I do use a cross peen, but um, I kind of like the round face on one and the flatter face on the other and not, not real tall hammer. Um, right. Well, Bailey makes those nice. They're so nice. Oh, uh, so all the hammers you've you've seen me use up to this point are Brent Bailey hammers. You're right, right. They're, they're my go-to hammer. Right, they're gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. So, um, good. Well, um, did you have anybody else? Yeah, anybody else have any questions? And then um, it got late today, like um, it's 7.40. So we are getting yeah. started. We're already two hours and 10 minutes in, so I'm not feeling the power on tonight unless y'all convince me otherwise, but um, we're going to need to make a decision at some point about when we hold the next session, so keep that in mind. So, so is this a good breaking stopping point? Is that what you're saying? Well, we're done with part one. Um, okay. This is where we're we going to stay here stop. another hour and a half. We could do part two, but I think it's going to go long. Um, right. So maybe not. I don't know. It could maybe it'll only take 45 minutes, but it's still getting kind of late. So right. Um, right. Why, don't, why don't everybody chime in on what you're thinking about that? Because um, we've got take a chance that John doesn't have to stay all day. If he does have to stay all day, then it's going to be late. We could move it to another time in February, um, which there's a Zoom on the third Thursday, but not next week or the 23rd. So um, what? Uh, how about next Thursday? Yeah, that's a Becky. little tough for Mike Sawinski, but he said he could maybe make it work. Did I can make that already... work. Oh, there you are. I can make <laughs> that work. work. Okay. Um, okay with for that, that. I'd vote for that. You'd yeah, vote for that. Fine. Beatrice, uh, Sean, what do you guys think? So moving it to next Thursday, just flat, not waiting to find out what uh, what happens on the day of jury duty. Yeah, just get just, ahead of it and not I'd be down know, with kind that. of wait around and see what happens. Well, I I might be like incarcerated when John, you know. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> aren't, the aren't there trial? some answers? Aren't there some answers you could give him that would excuse you from jury duty? Some biases <laughs> or something? You could get you could get out of it easy. <laughs> Does that work for you, Patrick? Mark? Yeah, that's perfectly fine sure. for me. No issue okay, for me at great. all. Thursday. Becky fun. said she's good. Sean, Jack. People are weighing in on the chat here. So, so uh, is it still 5.30 or do yeah. you want to go to 6.30? Okay, all right. Uh, well, <laughs> back up to the group. Um, don't we have somebody here from East Coast, Canada? Arizona. 
Arizona. That's Arizona. Easy. So you're an That's hour behind best. already. Yeah. No worries. But he's but John is retired. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I got things to do. Does that matter? <laughs> Uh, oh, Ryan uh, Bellinger, but I don't think he made it on the call tonight. Uh, Ryan said that he he, uh, he emailed in saying that he couldn't make it, but um, I can get a message out to him and make sure he knows. Yeah, make sure that he knows it's going to be, uh, sounds like next week. Is, how about, I'm going to ask this question another way. You can send a private message if you don't want to be called out. I won't say your name, but is there anybody that this absolutely won't work next Thursday? Dennis, you said you could make it. <laughs> you calling him out? What's that? <laughs> you calling him out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding him. He didn't say anything. He... <laughs> um, sounds like we're good for next Thursday. John, is that going to work for you? For yep. Okay. So Thursday the 9th at 530. Yeah, next Thursday. Um, she, I really enjoyed anything this. else. This was awesome. Yeah, it was really good. Though, a lot of neat things. Yep. I mean, here I've known John for 3,000 years. 3,000. And here I am learning stuff. You know. So, thank you, John. Yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent job. Yep. Thank you, John. Oh. Absolutely. 100% agree. For all agree. Two yeah. Hey, can awesome. I ask? It? Well, yes. Go for it. Um, I'm wondering what is a professional blacksmith? What's their hour, hourly rate? I work, I used to work with a lot of contractors, like 120 bucks an hour. And then in my second part two to that is bidding a job, like uh, doing this really fancy hand railing. How do you do that? To get where you don't lose your butt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I when I figure that out, I will let you know. <laughs> I, I used to sit down and you know come up with a design, you know, and talk to the cut, go through the whole thing, come up with this, and it's like, okay, how long is it gonna make this part? You know, it'll probably take four hours to do this and six hours to do that, and a day to do this, and, and just Kind of go through and tally everything up and okay i came up with 100 hours of time and how much material am i going to have to buy and figure that in and, and then start the job and then you get about halfway through it and gee i wonder how much time i have into this right now oh i'm at 120 hours and i'm not even halfway through oh well so and then, so then you start like bidding more per hour and then you don't get any work. The customer's not gonna pay $10,000 for this thing. And it's like, well, that's how much it's gonna cost. And I, I've got to the point, I don't, I don't do that anymore. I haven't done that for several years. I, I come down, get a drawing out, look at this. And I think this should cost about $4,000. That seems to be what I think this is worth. And so that's what I'm gonna bid it. And then, then I'll keep, I do much better on keeping 